nearest songbooks, please turn to number 15 and let's stand and sing together. Lead me to Calvary. Number 15, please. Soft stand, sing together. Brother Harvey, would you come in and pray for us, please? Father, we are thankful, Lord, for what you did for us on Calvary. Lord, for the price of our salvation. And the fact, Lord, that we didn't deserve it. Lord, we'll never deserve it. But, Lord, you did it because you left us. And, Father, we're thankful for all the things you've done for each one of our church family. For all that's been done here today. Help us to honor thee. Help us to praise thee for all that you have done. Meet every need of the service tonight, Father. Direct every word, every song, every uh, thing that is done. May it be for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Bless our preacher that's with us. Yes. Bless our pastor who leads us. And bless our membership, Lord, as they come to, from time to time to worship. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to do something a little different. They're, yes, they are. They're going to play. <laughs> the choir's coming down. We're going to fellowship. Shake hands with those around you. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord this evening. thankful you're at Mount Pisgah tonight. I appreciate so much you coming. We're going to change things totally around tonight or doing things different than what we do on a Sunday night. If you'll just follow our lead and go along with us, we'll get everything done. And I have to do that because I have to be at the funeral home tonight for a memorial service. But we'll still have a regular service and a good time just to do things a little bit different. I'm going to baptize tonight to start with right now. Bill, if you'll go ahead and get ready. I'll be back there in just a second. Uh, I got a nice letter from Bill this last week and 
two of his children were baptized last Sunday night and after he saw them being baptized and he sensed that he needed to be where his family was and his children were he made a big step to come here and uh, so we're thankful to have him and we appreciate so much uh, Brother Keith you can read this letter if you want to and I think it would be fine to read don't you Victoria? Read this and I'll get ready to baptize all right? Dear Reverend Walls Following the church service last Sunday evening, August 24, 1997, in which you baptized my two children, Micah and Tessa, the Lord spoke to me in a voice louder than words. He, in effect, reminded me that I belonged wherever my children needed me. I am currently a member of Andersonville United Methodist Church. I have been a Christian for many years. I assure you that I had already spent much time in prayer concerning transferring my church membership from Andersonville to Mount Pisgah. Now I see that by doing this, I can best reinforce the idea in Michael, Michael's and Tessa's minds that our family is united in Christ. Amen. Next Sunday morning, August 31, 1997, I shall bid farewell to Andersonville United Methodist Church. I'd like to ask you to set a date on which I may be baptized and become a member of Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. Thank you for your support and your prayers as I take this plunge of faith sincerely. Bill Chesty. So let's be sure and pray for this family. Right now, our ushers are going to come forward and we'll receive the evening offering. Ask my son to come up and pray for us. Craig? Dear Lord, thank you for this day you given us, Lord, and for loving us and caring for us. And thank you for this opportunity to come back to your house tonight, Lord. Thank you for the good service we had this morning. And Lord, just please speak to our hearts tonight, Lord, and just. Uh, anything that needs to be said to us, Lord, you just let it be said to us. Lord, please bless this offering. Please bless the gift and the givers. Thank you for letting us. want you to know we sure do love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless us as we give tonight. Yes. yes. If you have any money you want to place in the mission jar, you can do so at this time. If you're going to say a scripture verse, please just stay up here, okay? I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. That's good. God loved us and sent his son. Yes, he did. All right, girls. Come right up here. Come on up here. Okay, you ready? God shall supply all your needs. Is that it? Flipping all your needs. <laughs> All right. Dipping one, two, dipping for older knees. Yeah. And the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Amen. 
The B R B L E. Let's dance the book for me. I stand up on the word of God, the B R B L E Bible. Amen. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son to die on Calvary's tree. From sin to set me free, someday he's coming back. What glory that will be! Wonderful his love is to me. Amen. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. For I'm not ashamed of the go- gospel. Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation that everybody else. Per, <laughs> that, that everybody that believes. All right. Going over here. Okay. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Amen. That's good. All right. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Yes, it is. Let's give them a big hand. And the children may go to their class at this time. Children up to six years old may go downstairs to their class at this time. Let's go ahead and get, after this baptism, we'll get this set up, and then Brother Tom, you can come. This is Bill Chesney. I'm thankful Bill's doing this. Amen. Amen. And have him as part of our church family. And we love his family. They drive all the way from Lake City every service. And we appreciate that. And Bill, I'm thankful to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. This is a walk to give us a Good job. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Go that way. Just give us a second. We'll be right out. All right. Let me make just a couple announcements real quick. After the service, the teenagers and their parents are welcome to go up to the gym and have some pizza. We have plenty of it, and once it's gone, it's gone, so get up there, and we'll have a good time with that. Also, if you're interested in teaching a Sunday school class, working with children in any way, you may say, well, I'm not interested in teaching, but I am interested in helping. Please see me, and uh, we'll work something out with you, and uh, we've got something brand new we're going to work out, so please come see me, and uh, I appreciate that, okay? Ms. Walsh, you have an announcement for the... Ensemble comes to sing for us. Okay, ladies, just one last reminder. This Saturday at 9 o'clock, I want you to be here for our ladies' meeting. I promise you it will be a blessing to your heart. Please pray for this meeting. And this Thursday at 6.30 to 7.30 at my home, we're going to have a prayer meeting for that. And if you could come, I'd be glad to have you. See me for directions if you need them.
you young people. I got to hear it, didn't get to see it, but I got to hear it. But I appreciate you and appreciate the hard work that you do preparing for us. Also after church tonight, the Faith Rangers, if you're interested in working Faith Rangers, you'll need to meet up front for just a few minutes. You'll not take long. You'll not miss the going to Heidi's shower and to the pizza thing. Just take a few minutes. I want to see how much help we have. Is Sheila Lankford in here? Sheila? Stand up for a second. Sheila, you and, your, you and Robert for a second there, if you would. These folks fixed the meal for us today, for our family, Mr. Riley, and I want to tell you thank you publicly, and Tate was good. Every, everything was good. We had everything. And uh, Brother Riley had more than I did, but it was good anyway. <laughs> also, Angela Sharp's here. Angela, raise your hand. You're sitting down. Angela is a young lady we've been praying for for a long time, and she's finally out of the hospital and here at church tonight, and her mother and sister, and we're grateful she's here. Amen? Amen. A lot of folks have been praying for you. Didn't get to see, but they prayed for you, and I'm thankful you got to come tonight, all right? And we'll be talking to you. Okay, I believe there's one more thing we're going to do before Brother Riley preaches. Now, tonight, about 10 minutes after 8, I've got to slip out to go to the funeral home. Brother Riley will take care of the services. He and Brother Price uh, don't know what's going on, but they're going to take care of it anyway. And uh, we'll <laughs> Brother Paul Trotter, if you'll come and sing for us, Paul. And then when Paul is through singing for us, uh, Brother Ron's going to come and preach for us, okay? Thank you very much, and thanks again, young people. Thank you, Brother Tom. Think the young people did a good job. Would you say amen? amen. It's the future of the church. Uh, as long as in church, they're not in trouble normally. Tom probably wouldn't agree with that, but uh, trouble like you know, outside the church. Um, so I'd like to do for you tonight. After I heard the, the message this morning, uh, I think it's a promise. I, Jesus probably didn't say these exact words, but the name of the song is "I Rise Again."
again Drive the nails in my hands Laugh at me Where you stand Go ahead And say it isn't me The day will come When you will see Amen. He is coming back, isn't he? Yeah. Praise the Lord. That was wonderful. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'd like for you to turn to, with me to Isaiah 43, if you would. I want to say it's been a real honor to be here today. I thank Pastor Garvin for inviting me to come. I appreciate his friendship over the years, not only to me, but to our ministry also. One of the parts of ministry that we have had for many years, he has helped support from time to time. Your church has, that is. And this is our ministry at Daytona Beach, Florida. 
It's hard to believe we just finished our 30th year. Uh, I stop and think about that, Brother Keith. 30 years and going to Daytona Beach, Florida. That's a long time to be involved in one ministry. And uh, I think of my age now, I think I was around 12 or 13 when I started that ministry. I was sure hoping I was. But the Lord really has blessed that ministry in a wonderful way. Uh, we go there, uh, started with our own youth group over, over 30 years ago now. We took a small group of 20 kids just because we read an article in the newspaper, my wife and I. And the article was describing young people that go different places to have their spring break. And this article was talking about Daytona Beach, Florida. And um, so the Lord just really burdened our hearts to go there and take some of our young people. We took 20 kids. We went one day. I had never been there before in my life. I didn't grow up in Florida, so I wasn't familiar with Daytona. Uh, Jacksonville is only about 90 miles from Daytona, but I had literally never been there before in my life. But uh, we put this out to our young people, challenged our young people, and we could have easily taken 100 kids if I would have said we're going to go there, pass out some tracks, and have a party. But um, we were honest with them, told them what we were going to do. We were going to go there for a whole day. We go three now, but that first year we went one day and witnessed that entire day to college kids and high school kids and try to... Uh, introduce them to Christ and win some of them to the Lord. The article said that thousands of them would go there. And we found out that ought to be true, by the way, because we've been there on several occasions over the 30 years where there's been actually over 500,000 young people there while we're there witnessing. And that first year, we took 20 sold-out young people, set a goal to try to win at least uh, 75 young people to Christ. And when we got there, I didn't even, wasn't thinking. I just saw these young people on the streets and the parking lots of motels, not realizing that most of the thousands of them were down behind the motels in the beach area. We just let those 20 young people loose on their teams of two boys, two girls, and one adult, adult chaperone on each team. And they witnessed the entire day on those street corners and those parking lots some of the most beautiful scenes you could see uh, we saw that day. You, and by the way, you could spot our young people a mile away then. They all had their clothes on. And they still do 30 years later. We haven't changed that. And uh, to watch some of those young people stand there with an open Bible, leading other young people to Christ. When we finished that day, they did not win 75 people to Christ. They had won 233 people to the Lord. So we made it an annual event. On four different occasions now in these 30 years, Young people in three days of witnessing have been responsible for winning over 5,000 people to Christ. I have on my finger a beautiful gold ring. I love this ring. In fact, I cherish it. It's all hand engraved, but that's not the best thing about it. The best thing about it is the number on the inside. The number on the inside represents how many people were led to Christ in 1980, my last year at Trinity, and those kids gave me this ring. The number on the inside is 5,432. That's the number that 45 spirit-filled, fully clothed young people in three days of witnessing in 1980 won personally to Jesus Christ. And now it's a nationwide ministry. We have young people come from all over the country. This last spring, we had 85 young people, which is really a high number for us. Usually we have around 50 or 60. But we have 80, had 85 young people. About 85% of them had never been there before in their life, had never been involved in this kind of ministry. And God used them in three days of witnessing to win 2,850 people to a saving knowledge of Christ. And now in the 30 years, over 86,000 people have been saved in that ministry. Six of them, by the way, and I love to tell this, six of them, well, excuse me, that's six. Six of them right now are preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of them was a, a drug pusher there on the beach and got saved. One of our young people led him to Christ. And he was a divorcee at 20 years of age. Got back with his wife, got her saved, they got remarried, and he's a preacher of the gospel tonight. So this is what it's all about, and that is sharing the gospel of Christ. And we appreciate this church and how this church has been a blessing to our ministry over the years of going there from time to time to help support that ministry.
In Isaiah 43, we find uh, such a mandate, by the way, about witnessing, actually. We find this mandate to all of us who are saved. Isaiah 43, verse 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared, I have saved, I have showed. When there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Ye are my witnesses saith the Lord. When he says ye, he is referring to every Christian, not just preachers, not just full-time Christian workers, not even just adults, but he's talking about every saved person. That means every child, every teenager, every mom and dad, every adult. He's talking about all of us. See, we're not all called to preach, are we? None of the women are, are they? Well, I know at home they are, but not here at church. In fact, there are really, when you, it comes down to it, there aren't really that many men called to preach. When you think about all the men, in this building there are only few men that are called to preach, actually have a calling on their life to preach the gospel and proclaim the Word of God. Now, we're not all called to preach. We're not all called to be in full-time Christian service. But we are all called to be a witness for Him. Let me show you another passage. Turn to Acts chapter 1. I love... In fact, I love the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, I love. And this verse is so powerful. Actually, Jesus speaking in this verse, Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8, and he says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And look how positive this is, by the way. It's, it's completely, continually powerful and positive. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, under the uttermost part of the earth. And, of course, this verse teaching that all of us who are saved are called to be witnesses unto him, witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ, starting in our own Jerusalem, that is, our own backyard, our own town, our own city, among our own family members. That's where our witness begins. And then, of course, to the uttermost part of the earth, teaching missions. But that witnessing does not start in the uttermost part of the earth. That is, uh, on a mission field. It starts in our own backyard, in our own personal life, among our family members. And he said, you shall be witnesses unto me. How positive this is, that we shall be witnesses unto the Lord, that we should open our mouth and share the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So it's very clear in the Bible that we are all called to be a witness. Therefore, if we are, we ought to be the best witness that we can be for the Lord Jesus. In fact, that ought to be our desire. Our desire ought to be to be the best witness we can be for Christ long before I ever stood in a pulpit to preach or even had the inkling that I would ever stand in a pulpit and preach, God called me to be a witness. In fact, he put that desire in my heart immediately when I got saved. I believe he puts that, the des that, that desire in every believer's heart. When I first got saved, my salvation is a very unusual experience. I was not saved in a church. I was not saved in a youth rally, I was witnessed to by a 16-year-old girl who is my wife today, but back then she was a 16-year-old junior in high school. She witnessed to me, eventually won me to Christ. After I got saved, I went to Nancy, who wasn't my wife then, of course, and I said, Nancy, I mean, I was just saved. I said, Nancy, could you show me how to show other people what you showed me? Now, I didn't know the Bible language, see, I was a brand new Christian. I never owned a Bible before I was saved. I had a prayer book, I had a rosary, never owned a Bible, never read a Bible. But when I got saved, I went to her and I asked her, could you show me how to show the people you showed me? 
She said, I sure will. She bought me a brand new New Testament, sat down and taught me verse by verse how to win a lost soul to Christ. Took about an hour and a half and taught me that. I had the desire. Then I sought the knowledge how to do it. Then God gave me the opportunity. As soon as she taught me how to do that, it was just a few days later, sitting at lunchtime in Roper Stove Factory in Kankakee, Illinois, after eating my lunch, sitting there, reading my New Testament, and a six-foot-six basketball player from St. Patrick Central High School, the Roman Catholic High School that I graduated from, was walking by me, looked down, saw that I was reading my Bible. He said, Riley, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading my Bible. He said, you got to be kidding. You're reading what? I said, I'm reading my Bible. He said, what are you doing that for? I said, why don't you sit down? I'll show you why. And he sat down and had the joy of not only showing that six-foot-six basketball player how to be saved, but I had the joy of leading with Jesus Christ. See, I had the desire. I believe God gives us all the desire. Then we need to act upon that desire and then seek out how to do it, the knowledge. And then God will give us so many open doors. Oh, there are so many opportunities to open our mouth and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't believe any of us are exempt from that. We all have this call in our life. And I believe we ought to be the best witness we can be. And I want us to look in the Bible just briefly tonight and see what kind of witness the Lord wants us to be. If you have your Bibles, first of all, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll find out. First of all, the Lord wants us to be a careful witness. He wants us to be a careful witness. Now, what do we mean by a careful witness? What is a careful witness? Well, first of all, the Lord wants us to be careful with His Word. Careful with His Word. See, this is how people are saved. Don't let anybody tell you anything else. People are not saved by sitting around nature and feeling God coming in them. That's not how people are saved. People aren't saved by feeling. People are saved by faith. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, most people get saved because somebody reaches out to them. Somebody shares the gospel. Somebody preaches the gospel. Somebody prays for them. Most likely, most everybody in this building, there could be an exception. I've met five now since I've been saved over 34 years now. I've met five people that were saved on their own. It's very unusual. Usually someone has a part in our salvation, like my wife did. And my mother-in-law prayed for me for months to be saved, and so did others. And you can think of someone tonight who prayed for you, who touched your life, who gave the gospel to you. In most cases, that's true. Very few people are saved by reading the Bible. That's very rare. But if they do get saved on their own, you can't leave the Bible out of it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is that gospel? That Jesus was put on that cross, that he was nailed to that cross, that he shed all that blood, that he died for all humanity, that he was put in a grave, and the third day he got up and he lives forevermore, and he is able to save anyone who comes unto him. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know where that gospel is? Right here. It's in this Bible. The gospel is contained in the Bible. And to be a witness for Jesus Christ, we need to be very careful how we handle this Bible how we handle the Word, how we handle it, first of all, personally between us and the Lord as we read it and heed it and apply it to our life, and then as we take it and we share it. Witnessing is not what a lot of people think it is. Witnessing is not what a lot of Christians think it is. Many Christians make witnessing hard. Do you know that God has not called one of us to convince someone to become a Christian? Do you know that's not our job? Do you know that's not even the job of a preacher to convince someone that they need to come to Christ? If you'll study your Bible, you'll understand that is the job of the Holy Spirit. It's not my job to convict someone. If somebody walks out of a service and says, oh, I'll tell you, you just, oh, you got all over my toes. Oh, you, you just convicted. Now, I know what they're talking about, but I can't convict anybody. 
That's the job of the Holy Spirit. I can't convince someone, talk them into it. That is the job of the Holy Spirit, to speak to someone's heart and convince them that they need to come to Christ. That's not our job. We make witnessing many times much harder than it is. You know what witnessing is? Witnessing is laid out for us right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 5. Paul said, who then is Paul? Talking about himself. And who is Apollos? Another minister. But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now look at the plan of salvation, how to give the gospel to other people. He said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Have you ever had anybody say this to you or say this about you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yo, boy, I appreciate Brother Riley. He saved me. You ever had anybody say that? Boy, I had a real <laughs> weird experience one time. Uh, um, this, uh, these preachers from our church in Jacksonville were out witnessing on visitation, and they came up to this one house, and the porch was filled with people, and uh, they started to witness, and these people were, you know, had been drinking. Some of them were drunk. And this one woman uh, that lived there was, you know, she was kind of lit, you know. She was, and they, they were trying to witness to her. And she said, ah, I know about that being saved stuff. I know all about that. That old brother Riley saved me. Now, when I heard that, I thought, well, that's probably true. I probably did save her. <laughs> that's why she's still drinking. See, we can't save anybody. And God doesn't expect us to save anybody. What are we to do? Plant and water, and God gives the increase? You know, look what's involved in this. Look at verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Look at verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. You know what, one of the things witnessing provides in a Christian's life? Unity. Unity. Do you know this is one of the greatest things a church can do because it'll build unity within a church? A youth group, same thing. When young people get out and witness, it builds unity. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labors. Verse 9, for we are laborers, that's what we are, together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And witnessing simply is all about planting and watering. I think of all these souls that have been saved in Daytona. You can't imagine. The thousands of people that we have planted the gospel in their heart over these years and they rejected. You think about last year, 2,850 people being saved. We planted the God. We witnessed for seven hours in a day straight, all day long. We're turning from one person to another, sharing the gospel. Most, of, you can just think about this. If that's true, you understand that even though that sounds like a big number, 2,850, that isn't a big number, number compared to the people that we witness to. And I really believe that most of the people that we lead to Christ, or at least many, if not most, of the people that we lead to Christ at Daytona are people that somebody already witnessed to, somebody already prayed for. You can't imagine the young people that have said to us, oh, boy, I'm so glad I got saved. My grandmother, she's going to be so glad she's been praying for me for years to be saved. Or my mother, she's going to be so glad she's been praying for me to be saved. So winning is all about planting and watering, taking the Word of God and carefully planting that gospel in their heart. It's not talking somebody into it. It's planting and watering and God giving the increase. That is, God saving the soul. We just need to be very careful to take this book and use it to glorify His name. And that is by applying it to our everyday living and also taking this gospel and planning it. That's why don't ever get discouraged when you witness to somebody and they slam a door. Don't walk away and say, boy, I, that's terrible. They didn't get saved. Or you went on a, a soul winning visitation night and you witnessed about 10 people and none of them got saved. Don't get discouraged. If you had the opportunity to give one little witness, plant one little seed, that seed will go down to the heart and the Holy Spirit will take that seed and drill their heart with conviction, and one day down the line, they may come to Christ. You may never even know it, but it may happen. 
Our job is not to convince, to convict, but to plant and to water. Let's do it carefully. Not only that, we'll also be careful with our life. And what do we mean by being careful with our life? Because if we're saved and we know the Lord, all of us who are saved are to be a testimony for Christ. I told the young people that in Sunday school this morning. We testify in two ways. With our lips, as we tell the gospel, that's one way to testify. And also with our life, not just our lips. In fact, if we witness with our lips, we ought to have a life to back it up. And I say that especially to those who are family members around us who are lost, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, friends, people who do not know the Lord. And maybe one day we witness to them, they rejected Christ like my mother and father did. All my brothers did. When I witness to them, you probably have experienced that also with family members or maybe friends, people you work with, and they reject the gospel, and they say no to Christ, and they walk away. But I'll guarantee you, once we set a witness on someone and share that gospel in their heart, I'll guarantee you, they lock their eyes upon our life, and they start watching us. In most cases, we don't realize it. But I want to guarantee you tonight, if you are living for Christ and you are a witness for him, someone is watching you. If you claim Christ as your Savior, someone is watching you. And what they're watching is your life. And we're to be a testimony for the Lord Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Titus here, just a few books over. Uh, the book of Titus in the New Testament there. And look at a couple of passages here to do with this. Being careful with our life to have a testimony for Christ. In Titus chapter 2, look at verse 12, talking about the grace of God teaching us. That's talking about God's grace teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's how we're to live if we're saved. And that's maintaining a testimony. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, that is the coming of Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And look at this, and purifying himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That word peculiar there does not mean weird, thank God. He hasn't called us to be a weird people, but a different people. A people that have a testimony for the Lord Jesus. If you look down in chapter 3 and in verse 8, this is a faithful saying in these things, I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful. Look at this. Might be careful to maintain good works. Why? These things are good and profitable unto all men. We're to be careful to maintain good works. I don't believe anybody can get saved by works. I was taught in my life, work hard, be the best kid you can be. Man, be an altar boy, go to church, do this, do that. And if you be the best guy you can be, and somehow, some way, and it was always, maybe when you die, you'll go to heaven. Well, my Bible says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to God's mercy that he saves us. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nobody can get saved by works. Nobody will stand before God and say, hey, look at all these things, things I've done. Now, can I get into heaven? Mm -mm. The only thing you get us into heaven is the blood of Christ, the grace of God, and we put our faith and trust in him and received him. That's salvation. I believe that all my heart. I also believe this. Even though we're not saved by works, when we get saved, we ought to go to work. We ought to serve him. Because people are watching and people are looking. And you know what James said? James said, we show our faith by our works. That has nothing to do with salvation there and being saved. A lot of people get that confused. James simply was saying, we show, we show our faith as we serve, as we live for Christ, as we, and the Bible says, we need to be very careful to maintain a testimony. Good works for Christ. Look over in, in, in verse 14. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful, that they be not unfruitful. How can we be fruitful? Not only by sharing the gospel, 
but by living for Christ. And that testimony before a lost and dying world, we need to be a careful witness. Not only that, we need to be a confident witness. Not just a careful witness, but a confident witness. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We are to be a competent witness. Now, I don't want us to misunderstand here. When I say confident, I don't mean cocky. There's a big difference. I don't believe God's called us, any of us, to be cocky. He doesn't want us to be cocky. But I do believe this. I believe he wants us to be a confident Christian. Now, how can we be a confident Christian and be biblical and not be cocky? There's a big difference there, isn't there? You ever met a cocky person that you'd like to slap? Excuse me. I mean, have you ever met a cocky Christian? <laughs> Nothing worse than a cocky Christian. There's a big difference between cockiness and the Lord's confidence. Now, why do we need that confidence? Well, if you look in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul said, But I would, you should understand, brethren, all saved people, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the God. And boy, I love that. Paul said, Everything that's happened to me in my life has fallen out to the furthering of the gospel. Isn't that wonderful? And then he said in verse 13, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palaces and in all the places. Look at verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Why do we need to be a confident witness? I'll tell you why. Have you ever witnessed this? I mean, have you ever talked to someone just in regular conversation? Isn't it easy to sit and talk about football and basketball and sports and whatever you women talk about? Dolls and so forth. I don't know what you're talking about, but isn't that easy to sit around? Oh, you talk about your kids. I hear women talking, they you know, have babies. I guess it's called baby talk. I don't know. They're saying to her, oh, yeah, my baby did this and my baby did it. Now, that's, that, no, that's normal for a woman to do that. I don't think men ought to sit around and talk like that. I don't think that's normal. Yes, my baby did this. My, no, that's not normal. Now, if you're going to talk about your baby, there's nothing wrong with being proud of your baby, your grandbaby, but a man ought to sit around and say, yeah, my kid did this and my kid did that. That's the way to go. <laughs> don't you think we ought to be different? <laughs> because we do live in a different day, don't we? No, I mean, you think about this. It's easy to sit and talk about anything under the sun all of a sudden when the Holy Spirit lays it on your heart to give a witness. You know what all of us do? And I don't believe there's an exception. We get scared. All of a sudden, there is no boldness. We're scared. You say, oh, Brother Riley, I know so-and-so, and, -so and they, I'll tell you, they're witnessing. I'll tell you, if I, could, if I just had the personality of that person, I could be a witness for God. Let me tell you something. It really doesn't have to do with personality. Looks, personality, money, background has nothing to do with it. Now, I do believe that God uses our personalities, all of us. That's why he gave us all a different personality. Just think if this, everybody had the same one. It'd be awful, especially you think about somebody who doesn't have a good personality. You know, I have been accused across this country of making many faces. And I do have some faces that I make. My wife says, Ron, one of these days you're going to get stuck with one of them. <laughs> Just think if everybody had the personality I had, you know, went around making faces. Well, God's made us all uniquely different. But personality is not the key to witnessing. It's God's power. And that power, by the way, first of all, we all have access to. It's available to all of us. You don't have to be a preacher to have God's power. You don't even have to be an adult. These little children here tonight, these young people can be filled with the power of God. And they need to be. We need God's power to overcome evil. We need God's power to allow us to open our mouth and share the gospel. We can have that power. 
Notice this word at the end of the last verse I read, verse 14, fear. It's something we all share, fear. Now, men don't like to hear that. I'm going to make a statement. Everybody's afraid of something. Men don't like to hear that. Because men react this way, I ain't afraid of nothing. They're lying. I don't care who they are, they're lying. Everybody's afraid of something. You know why men say that? If your man says that to you, by the way, now nah, it's great that he's bold like that and I'll protect you, baby. I'm not afraid of nothing. That's great, I like that. But he's lying. Because everybody's afraid of something. Even Brother Keith, as big as he is, he's afraid of something. I don't know, maybe it's his wife. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it may be that boy of his. <laughs> Bigger than him now. Well, we're all afraid of something. You, you know what men mean when they say that? They're not afraid of what you're afraid of. See, everybody has different fears. For, for instance, we got a good-sized crowd here tonight. I can tell you that there are probably some ladies in here, some girls that are afraid of mice. See, I saw some, yeah, yeah, I saw those looks. There may even be some men like that. See, we all don't, don't share the same fears. I, I, I don't have a fear of mice. I remember waking up in a motel one morning. Kind of tell what kind of motel this was, by the way. I've been in a few of them. And I went to bed that night alone. And I woke up about 5.30 or 6 in the morning, and I heard this noise, some, like somebody was eating. I flipped the light on over by the garbage can. Here sat a mouse up on its hind legs licking a cap candy wrapper. And man, when I saw that mouse, I, now I didn't go, ah! Boy, a lot of women would. Maybe a few men. I'll tell you what I did. Now, I didn't go, no problem. You know, I'm roll over. I went, ooh, you know, mouse. And I reached over and I grabbed my, my Bowie knife. Oh, yeah, that's about that long. And now, this didn't work, by the way. I pulled that Bowie knife out and I aimed it at that mouse. And I went, whoo! Boy, it went flying through the air and it stuck right in the garbage pail. You know, that rubber <laughs> garbage pail. Of course, the mouse ran away, and I had to play with that mouse the rest of the week. But now that's not my fear. See, we all don't have the same fear. I, hey, I know, some, I know some people are afraid of rats. Now, I don't like rats, brother. Let me tell you something. But I'm not terrified of them. If I saw a rat, I'd go, oh, man. I'd, well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd want to do battle with that rat. I'd want to try to kill him. I mean, I wouldn't walk up and say, hey, I like your whiskers, man. Yeah. <laughs> cool tail. Yeah. No, I'd be concerned about a rat. I'm not afraid of snakes. Now, I know some men that are terrified of snakes. I was in this meeting in California, and this teenage boy came up and said, he was the pa uh, pastor's son, teenager. He said, brother, why am I dead <laughs> afraid of snakes? He said, look at this. And he had this great big rubber snake, long thing. Man, it looked real to me. Put it right in my face. And, man, that thing looks real. He said, you know what I did with this? He said, my dad was in the bathroom the other day. And he said, I laid that snake right in front of the bathroom door. He said, dad, come on here. Hurry up. He said, my dad opened that door and stepped on that snake. He said, brother, he jumped five feet in the air. <laughs> I just stood there and laughed. <laughs> now, y'all laugh, but see, that's not really funny. <laughs> it's not funny to try to scare someone with their fear. Like to walk up to a woman with a dead mouse and say, look, look, look what I got. <laughs> now, I have a fear. I have a fear of spiders. Now, I don't know where this came from. I don't know why, but I have this unbelievable fear of spiders. Doesn't matter the size, what kind, although I have made a study of them. I know the most vicious ones, the violin-shaped one, the brown recluse. They're the most dangerous, very poisonous. Stay away from them. But really, any size, it doesn't matter. I'd rather fight a lion than one of those little spiders. And I've done battle with them. I know what it's like. I have. I don't know where this fear came from. But people try to scare me with this fear. I stood in a church one night, and the ceiling was about the same height of this, but, it, but the kind of scene it was had those slats, you know, you can pull those slats back. And the preacher, the pastor of that church, who used to be my friend, had somebody up there, <laughs> and he had it rigged with a string to pull that slat back. When I said, open your Bibles, he pulled that string back, and this giant black, 
rubber spider came flying in my face. Now, that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was at the end of that meeting was my birthday, and they had a birthday party for me. And he said, oh, brother, we got two gifts for you. And they gave me this one beautiful Bible commentary. I said, oh, man, that's nice. He said, now we got another one. Oh, you'll love this gift, Brother Riley. Just flip. All you do is flip the lid on that box. That's all you have to do is just flip it over. And I flipped that lid, and you know what came out of that box? A live tarantula. I made a new door right there in that wall. <laughs> my wife found out this fear when we first got married. Our honeymoon was a three-day trip down to Greenville, South Carolina to go to college. Our first abode to live in was a little trailer, and I mean little. This trailer was so dinky. Let me tell you how small this trailer was. Walk in the front door, turn to the right, you're in the living room. Three steps to the left, you're at the kitchen sink. Five steps to the back of the trailer, you're not in the bedroom, you're on the bed. That trailer had the smallest bathroom I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, that shower, you'd have to get in there and take a shower like this. That bathroom was so small, you could actually sit in the commode and wash your hands at the same time. <laughs> I never did that. I just noticed that's how small it was. First night, I walked out of that bathroom. You know, we're on our honeymoon. They said, we just got married. My wife, man, I was a man, you know, till that night. I walked out of that bathroom, and I stepped up on the bed trying to be funny with my I said, look at this bed. Isn't this stupid? I said, look at this. And I looked up, and I saw this thousand leggers have you ever seen a thousand legger spider do you know how fast a thousand legger is i mean how fast would you be if you had a thousand legs and there he was looking at me you know and that's how that went ah! and nancy looked at me and says what's wrong a spider she said you gotta be kidding ron you're not afraid of that spider yes I said, kill it. She said, I'm not going to kill it. She said, you're the man. Well, you used to be. You kill it. And she wouldn't help me. Now, this doesn't work, by the way. I took a shoe, just like that knife. It didn't work. Because I don't go up to them. I don't, oh, no, man. They can leap. They can stick their head out. So I threw this shoe. And, of course, they're so fast. That thousand legs. And went in the cupboard. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> He's back in that cupboard. I thought, honey, would you go in there and go? No, I'm not going to. I'm going to bed. I, I begged her. I begged her. On my knees, I begged her. Please. No, she wouldn't do it. So we went to bed. I said, I got to keep the lights on. <laughs> he said, oh, come on, brother. I, hey, let me tell you. Don't you understand that they have family? <laughs> Just like you do. They have friends. They have neighbors. And you know that night, this is the honest truth. First of all, I slept with a 22 pistol right here. <laughs> I really did. It's a good thing I dropped it in the middle of the night because I had a dream when I finally went to sleep. And I dreamed that thousand-legger came out of there, had all of its family, all of its neighbors, all of its friends. There were hundreds of them. And they came and they picked me up off the bed. And they carried me out of the trailer. When I woke up, those spiders were eating me alive. In fact, I grabbed my wife. I almost killed her, I think, you know. You say, well, right, brother, right, that is stupid. It may be stupid to you, but it's not to me. I have a fear of spiders. We all don't have the same fear. We have different fears. I'm going to tell you one thing. We all share. We all share the fear of opening our mouth. Is there a family member tonight you need to open your mouth to? and boldly tell them the gospel? Is there a neighbor that needs you to boldly open your mouth and share that gospel? God's power provides that. And we have access to that power. In Acts chapter 1, uh, chapter 4 rather, and in verse 31, the Bible tells us how to get that power. The Bible tells us in that verse, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spake the word of God with boldness. How did that boldness come? It came from God's power, not from personality, not from ingenuity, not from someone's intelligence. It came from God's power. And God wants all of us to have that power, that we can boldly give a witness. Now, I've seen this power work year after year at Daytona Beach, Florida. And some of the shy... 
By the way, some of the shyest people I've ever met in my life have made some of the best witnesses for Christ because they claim God's power in their life. I remember one year, 17-year-old girl, senior in high school, Patty Teal. I'll never forget Patty. If she was 90 pounds soaking wet, I'd be shocked. She was so skinny, that girl. Very, very light-complected. Could get sunburned very easily. One of the things we teach all of our young people when they go there, put a lot of sunblock on. She didn't put enough on that her senior year. And by the second day, she was badly burned. And she was also sick. The chaperone brought her to me. And I said, Patty, you're burned bad. And I said, and, you, and you, you're sick also. It's very obvious. I said, I'm going to have to send you home. And boy, she didn't. She said, oh, no. No, I don't want to go home. Then she started crying. I said, no, no, don't cry, whatever you do. I said, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to sleep on tonight. When we wake up in the morning, I'm going to talk about it. I already made up my mind I was going to send her home. Next day, the chaperone brought her to me. said, Brother Riley, Patty's better. She feels better, and she's not sick. But, of course, the sunburn is there. I said, Patty, I, I, said, I, I really feel like I need to send you home. Now, she started crying big time then, you know. I said, oh, don't do that. Don't cry. I, I, and she says, if you'll just put my team in the shade somewhere and I'll just sit on the bench somewhere. I said, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put your team across on the beach up in this uh, shopping center in the shaded area, and there's a place like this where there are benches. You sit on the bench and you don't move out of that area. If somebody happens to come by and sit by you, uh, you know, you can witness to them, possibly lead them to Christ. She spent that whole day in that shopping center. At the end of that day, that chaperone came to me. I said, Patty didn't move off that bench, did she? She said, oh, Brother Rice, she didn't move the whole day. She sat on that bench. But you know what that girl did? She called people over to her, and she sat there that whole day witnessing time after time. And that girl sat on that bench in the shade calling people over to her and led 51 people to Jesus Christ. On that trip, that girl won over 200 souls to Jesus Christ. Why? Because she has beauty because she has intelligence, because she has an unbelievable personality? No, because of God's power. And we can have that power tonight. We're to be a confident witness, a careful witness. Then the last thing I want us to see, if we'll turn to John chapter 3, we are to be a compelling witness, a compelling witness. And why is that needful tonight, to be a compelling witness? Well, I thank God that Nancy compelled me to come to Christ. And that's what people need. People need someone to reach out to them and compel them that they might come to Christ. In John 3, 16, we see, uh, John 3, 16 and 17, we see why. Maybe one of the most famous verses in the Bible, verse 16. We see it on television all the time at a sporting event. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth not is condemned already, but he that believeth is saved. Once we believe in the name of Christ, we receive him, we're saved. But before that time, the Bible says that the condemnation hangs over our head. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned. Look at the word, already. Somebody is not going to stand before God all of a sudden one day and get condemned. We're already condemned. Every person that's born in this world is condemned already. And that's why somebody tonight needs you to compel them to come to Christ. Why? Because they're condemned already. And what's it like to be condemned already? That means they're lost. And what's it like to be lost tonight? What's it like to be a lost person, spiritually lost? The Lord compares them to sheep. All human beings, we all like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all because we're like sheep. And sheep without the shepherd are totally lost. They're blinded. They cannot see. That's the way a lost person is. They're blinded spiritually. They cannot see. They cannot understand. If you have somebody say, well, you see that person over there? And I'm going to tell you, they're not saved, but they really know the Bible. No, they don't. They might be able to quote the Bible, but they don't understand the Bible because they are spiritually blinded. They cannot see. They cannot understand. Not only that, a lost person is totally empty. If you're here tonight and you do not know Christ, this is a description of you tonight. 
A lost person is totally empty. Why do you think they drink alcohol and take drugs and live immoral? They're trying to fill up the emptiness, the vacuum that only Christ can fill. But they go to the world and they go to the things of the world to try to fill that vacuum. A lost person is empty. Not only that, they're lonely. A lost person is lonely. Many times we don't realize how lonely they are. Think about that. We as Christians, from time to time, we get lonely, and we have the Lord. Think of how lonely a lost person is. Blinded, empty, alone, without Christ, without love, wandering as if they're in the dark, confused, not knowing where to turn. And that's why they need us tonight to compel them to come to Christ. They're not going to come on their own. They need someone to compel them to knock on their door, to make a phone call to them, to write a letter to them, to give them the gospel, to try to bring them to Christ. And why is that so important? Because they're condemned already. They're condemned already. One day the books shall be opened, Revelation chapter 20. And another book, which is the book of life. And the Bible says those names that are not written in the book of life, did you hear it? Those names, maybe a mother, maybe a father, maybe a brother, a sister, a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, someone maybe you've known all your life, those names that are not written in the book of life shall, not maybe, shall be cast into the lake of fire. And then angels shall come and take them, and they shall be cast into the lake of fire. He didn't say like a lake of fire. Jesus didn't describe hell like that. He described hell with fire, not like fire, the fire that is never quenched, the fire that is never quenched. When I hear about people describing hell, those who are unsaved and have no idea, they joke about it. Well, when I go to hell, I'll see all my friends. No, they won't. They will be in outer darkness. You say, well, how can they be in outer darkness if there's real fire in hell? Do you understand the hottest flame that burns doesn't even give off light? In hell, in the final abode, the lake of fire, that's real fire. Not make-believe, not someone's imagination. It is real fire fire as the rich man who lifted up his eyes in hell and he cried out I am in torment someone please help me father Abraham please send one someone to dip their finger in the water and drop just a little drop of water upon my tongue for I am tormented in this flame let me tell you in hell there's torment tonight there's outer darkness tonight it's a bottomless pit tonight. There's no end to it. And in hell, there are no exits like there is in this building. There are no exits. There's no way out. And when people go to hell, they will cry out for eternity, for mercy and love and salvation. But there'll be none. It's the place where their worm dieth not the memory is always there. They'll remember every time they heard the gospel. And they will be screaming for all eternity, Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why didn't I get saved? Why didn't I listen to that preacher? Why didn't I listen to my mom? Oh, God, please save me now. Have mercy now. But in hell, there's no mercy. There's no love. There's no Jesus. There's no Bible. And there are no exits. If you have a loved one tonight, like I do, you have a friend tonight, you have a neighbor like I do, without Christ, if they die this moment, this is their plight. Hell, the lake of fire, forever and ever. I've never been to hell. I've never heard those screams. But I stood and looked into the mouth of death a car engulfed in flames sat a 19-year-old boy all alone 
And in hell, even though there'll be millions of people, they'll be alone. And he sat in those flames, 19 years old, burning, screaming for someone to help him. Somebody please help me. I'm trapped. And the car door was jammed after the wreck, and he couldn't open it. And the three teenage boys, or four teenage boys that stood next to me saw the entire accident. All alone, he came off the top of that expressway. The car exploded. And they said, we could hear his voice, sir. And they had tears coming down their face. We could hear him screaming, somebody please help me. Somebody please, I'm on fire, I'm burning up. And the last they heard was this cry, help! And the voice faded. And we stood in horror, hundreds of people, as we watched the firemen pry the car door open finally and take the charred body of a teenager out of that car that died all alone. And that is a picture of hell tonight, alone forever in the flames. And my friend tonight, if you're not saved, I beg you to come to Christ before it's too late. And dear Christian tonight, I ask you to think of someone Someone tonight that needs you to compel them before it's too late, forever and ever. And I believe God will use us to reach out to those who need his love. You see, the only hands, the only feet, the only lips that Jesus has, they're yours and they're mine. He no longer walks this earth, but we're here, and that's why we're called ambassadors for Christ. We're here in his stead to give that gospel and to compel them to come to Christ. And I hope you'll let God use you to be this kind of witness. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed as we pray. And I hope you're praying for someone tonight who needs the Lord. Most everyone in this building knows the Lord, but there may be someone in this building without Christ tonight. You don't know you're saved. And God is speaking to your heart tonight. You're not sure if you died this moment you'd go to heaven. Most of us are believers, and we'd like to pray for you. We'd like to help you tonight, my friend. We'd like to help you to find Christ. And if you're in this building and you need the Lord, we're going to ask you to do something in a moment. But all of us who do know Christ and know we're saved, I wonder how many God is speaking to your heart tonight about a neighbor, a friend, a family member that's lost. And God needs you to be a confident, careful, compelling witness to try to win them to Christ. And you'd say tonight, I want to be the best witness I can be for the Lord. And I'm asking God for that power tonight. I'm asking God for a broken heart tonight to be a better witness for him. Here's my hand, Brother I Would you pray with me all over the building? Would you raise those hands? God bless you. Thank you there. Thank you all over the building. Thank you. God bless each one of you. Amen. And you know the Lord knows your heart tonight. And I wonder how many of you tonight have someone on your heart that's lost, like I do, my 82-year-old mother who's lost. And I pray for every day to be saved. I remember the day she disowned me because I witnessed to her. And she's still not saved. Do you have someone on your heart tonight? A mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a family member, a friend, a neighbor? And God has laid those people on your heart tonight. And you're asking special prayer for those people tonight. If that is true in your life, would you slip your hand up? Let's pray for those people. God bless you. Many of you all across the building. God bless you. And you know the Lord knows exactly who you have in your heart tonight. And we need to claim them for Christ right now. And pray for him. And we're going to do that in a moment. I wonder if you're sitting here not sure you're saved yourself. Not positive if you died right this moment, you'd go to heaven. And God is speaking to your heart. And you believe you need to be saved before it's too late. And you die and go to hell. You'd say, preacher, would you just pray for me tonight? I need to be saved. 
would you pray for me? If that's your need, would you slip that hand up wherever you're at and put it back down, and we're going to include you in this prayer. Anyone like that? You're not sure if you died this moment, you'd go to heaven, and you don't want to die and go to hell, and you'll slip that hand up right now. Anyone at all, just slip it up and put it back down. Anyone. Anyone in the building, we don't want to miss you. Anyone? God bless you back there. I see that hand. Thank you. Little boy, I see your hand. We're going to pray for you. God bless you, son. Thank you. Would there be someone else not sure you're saved tonight? Need to settle that right now. Anyone else? Before we pray. Anyone? Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed, our eyes closed before the Lord. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and the Lord is speaking to our hearts, may we lift our hearts to him. Father, thank you tonight for your goodness to us. We want to take time to thank you for sending someone to us to give us the gospel and love us and pray for us. And Lord, I pray for many Christians tonight that want to be a better witness for you. And Lord, may we lay it all on the line tonight and ask you to help us to be a better witness. Claim your power tonight. And Lord, how we do need compassion. We need so much compassion. And Lord, I pray you'll break our hearts tonight and give us compassion that we lack for a lost and dying world. And Lord, I pray with many tonight that have lost family members and lost neighbors and friends, people that are going to hell on their way to hell right now. We pray, oh God, that we might reach out to them and love them and show them Christ and share with them the gospel, that we might have the joy of leading them to Christ. And we pray for so many represented by hands raised a moment ago on their way to hell. I pray you'll save them in Christ's name. And Lord, I pray for these that need the Lord tonight especially this one little boy that raised his hand. Give understanding to his heart. May he be saved even this night. We pray you'll bless our invitation. We ask it in Christ's name. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. In a moment, we're going to have the psalm invitation. I'm going to ask Christians from all over the building to come to this altar and on our knees before the Lord. Ask God to use us to be a better witness for him coming here and claiming that power on our knees before the Lord, claiming that compassion, asking God to give us more compassion, and then praying for that family member, that friend that's lost tonight. Would you come to this altar and do that? And tonight, maybe you've already been saved. Maybe someone led you to Christ at home or in the hospital somewhere else, and you need to take an open stand for Christ tonight. I want to invite you to come and meet us down here in the front, and you'll take your open stand for the Lord. We'll tell the people about your salvation that you've been saved. Would you do that tonight? If God is speaking to you, do it as the instruments play. Would you come right now from all over the building? Would you come and pray for that family member, that friend? Would you come and claim that power, that compassion tonight? And ask God to break your heart tonight. And would you come and pray for that loved one, that friend that God laid upon your heart? Claim them here at this altar. And let's go out of this building tonight determined to be a better witness for him. Who else will step out and come right now? God is speaking to your heart. And did God lay a name upon your heart tonight? Or some names on your heart tonight? A face or some faces of those that are on their way to hell tonight? And they need your prayers tonight. They need your compassion tonight. Why don't you come and pray for them right here at this altar? Why don't you come and claim them for God? Why don't you come and join these that are here, telling the Lord that you want to be a better witness for him? Who else will come and join us here? As the instruments play, who else will step out and come? God is speaking to your heart. And maybe you need to come and take your open stand for the Lord tonight. Father, Lord, and believers' baptism. Whatever God is speaking to your heart about, take that stand for him tonight. Who else will come? Who else will come right now? God is speaking to you. We're going to have a word of prayer with all these that have come in just a moment. Who else will come and join us? Many other hands were raised about a lost loved one, a lost friend. Why don't you come and pray for him tonight? Many other hands were raised about God's power in your life to be a better witness for him. Why don't you come and tell the Lord about that right now? Who else will come? Anyone else? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for all these that have come tonight. And Lord, we do lack your power tonight, how we need that power in our life. And I pray, oh God, that you might grant us that power. Lord, we need compassion. We think about people in our families that are going to hell tonight. 
our neighbors, our friends, people we work with that need the Lord. And as the song says, people need the Lord, and they do. They need you tonight. And I pray, O oh Lord, for many tonight that are on their way to hell, possibly that have already been witnessed to by people in this auditorium. God, we pray for them tonight that you might speak to them, convict them, draw them to the cross of Christ. And may we show Christ in our lives toward them. And Lord, we pray that you'll honor your word and honor the gospel. And may many souls be saved because of this service tonight and commitments that have been made by heart, from hearts of Christians to be a better witness for you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I ask Brother Christ to come and close out the service. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. May the dear Lord in heaven help us to be a careful, confident, and compelling witness for him. We're going to sing one verse together. One verse. If you need to come for whatever reason, I invite you to come as the Lord speaks to our heart. Brother Harvey, let's sing one verse. Just as I am without one You can be seated just for a moment, if you would please. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and we're remaining in a prayerful attitude just for another moment or two.